Hi everyone, I'm here with Sam and Dari today, who's from uh, D- D2R, which is a collections and recoveries system. And you're based in Canada, but I know you've got work over here in the UK as well, so you cover both markets. So Sam, thanks very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hey Chris, how are you doing? Thank you very much for having me. I suppose I wanted to start off really just to find out a bit about some of the trends you're seeing. Obviously, you sit across multiple markets as well, so that'd be interesting. But what are some of the trends you're seeing, particularly in terms of like collections best practice, some of the themes that you're being asked about from clients? Absolutely. I think the first trend we see is that the collection process has become more professional and more, let's say, systematic. There's a demand definitely from the collection agencies to look at ways to automate, to have visibility, to have predictive results and be on top of things. It's a definitely different market today than you would say 10 years ago. Mm. And what about things like digital adoption? We spent a bit of time together when I was over in Canada and, and certainly back here. And it does feel like there's like different streams of adoption or different levels of adoption or different approaches, maybe by my market. How, how do you think that, how do you really compare? Yeah, I mean, interesting. COVID times, we thought the adoption would be really high mm. just because everybody had to leave the offices and they needed uh, systems that are, you can use it from home and web-based. Mm. But that wasn't the concern of the collection agency. They were concerned about surviving. I have a business after this. Mm. Post-COVID, definitely in the last year, we've seen a high level of adoptions. Everybody Mm. wanted to get out of what they had before. They've been using for 30 years. We need to move to something else. The interesting part is the level of adoption by market. Mm. I would say the U.S. initially, they've always been early adopters. Mm. Uh, Canada, they've always been on the wait and see, uh, I want to see uh, uh, this thing taking off. The interesting market for us was the UK. Every time we talked to a new customer and any new customer we adopted, they were very high on digital adoption. They wanted mm-hmm. the best and the latest. They wanted to see what can you do for me. Give me what you have today and I'll learn the, I'll use other stuff later, but I just mm-hmm. want to be on platform. And that was really very su- big surprise to us. We did not understand the UK market by any stretch of imagination. Now I think we have a better idea. Yeah. What do you think drives the differences between markets then? Culturally, we're all on our phones. We're all we're all on what would be the internet and using slight stuff personally. But what do you think drive different adoptions by business? Why do you think there's a different kind of culture that happens between the different markets? Yeah, I think this sort of ownership, I, I've been the ownership in the UK is seems to me today, even the older ones, they want to move on. They want to hand it over to the next generation and they want to give them mm-hmm. something that they can start with. In Canada, has been more, we're beating a dead horse. We've used what we've used for so many years. It's enough. U.S., they're always open to, to newer stuff. Not an easy thing to say because when you're moving your system, that's not only a system change. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a change for the organization, process, how you do things. And that effect, effectively, that's what we do in D2R mm. Collect, we change all your habits. And and I suppose just quite interesting in terms of like sales culture or buying culture between the different ones in terms of like speed to buy as well. So you mentioned that Canada was probably quite conservative maybe, but how do you see that? Is the US pretty quick to say, look, we will implement something once we made a decision? So or is that just, is that stereotypical? I think they, they make quick quicker decisions, put it that way. They execution is different piece, but they make it quicker decision. But they make quick, quicker decisions both ways. They mm. they will say, yeah, I'll try it. And they do initial proof of concept. And they say, I don't like it. I'm out or I'm in. Mm. We've been lucky, <laughs> but mm. we've seen it in, in, in places where we talk to somebody and they've already started the process somebody else. And they come back to us a few months later and say, oh, mm. we, we want to look at your stuff again. But, mm. And we ask, but you were looking at somebody else. Yeah, wasn't what we're looking for. Right, mm. that they didn't meet. UK has been really a fresh breath of air in the way they're looking at stuff. There's presumption on one piece is that what you give them state of the art, it's the mm. latest, it's it will move them places. And but they've been quick adopters. Mm. They're looking at competitors in the market, they say, hmm, they're servicing my clients better than I do. Mm. 
They're more efficient. They're more cost effective. It's what are they using? Referrals. Our client, our clients in the UK, which is really different from anywhere else, they've been referring us to other collection agencies. That is not typical in, in North America. Yeah. And how much opportunity do you think there is? So when you look at which will be new clients and this is the state of evolution of what they have today, which obviously they're upgrading from, how much opportunity do you think there is? We always look at and we always tend to focus on large banks or large financial services providers and we think oh, they're, they're so far ahead the reality on the inside can be quite different and certainly the reality elsewhere in the market can be quite different how would you assess that market in terms of state of evolution and how much opportunity there is to introduce new kind of systems and new kind of techniques absolutely we have to look at the way we do business how does business work mm. and, and and for us today uh, 80% all of us to business by buying something and I'll pay it on mm. a term point of view. Tomorrow, next month, end of the month, credit card, whatever it is. So that model is open for people defaulting on payments. So the opportunity is, is from a point of view of business-wise, it's huge. Mm. Now, we, we focus pri primarily on a very selective group of people, collections and collectors. But you look at all the larger enterprises, they still haven't moved. They, mm. If they have a higher quality systems, enterprise system in the office, they would have a collection piece. Mm. It, it's not maybe as specialized as we have, and maybe it's not as cost effective, but they have it. Uh, would they be adopting things like what we have? Absolutely. Mm. Because all everybody's looking for, in a way, best of breed or best in the market. How, how does it help me better? And this is where we're seeing since the beginning of the year, oh, I know you don't do this market or this kind of industry, but would you be open to it? We never had that before. We were always mm. chasing uh, clientele and markets. The market's coming to us today. And that's because of that adoption of digitization and uh, adoption of uh, newer systems. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it does feel like there's there's quite a big opportunity out there. And if you look at it, the, a lot of systems seem to be quite antiquated to a certain extent. So almost like we're going through quite a big sort of like changeover. Do you think that some of that's driven by things like adoption of cloud technology, some of those kind of things, which makes us, we've seen that kind of come through, which makes it easier, doesn't it, to adopt some of these things? Absolutely. Absolutely. You look at how we live today. How do you book your trips and your hotel? I mean, mm. hotel. Airbnb, all that stuff. It's all electronic, yeah. right? You have a choice and people want choice today. They want sort of choice and they, their expectations are high. Mm. They're open for mistakes, but they say, hey, at least I can do it now and I don't have to be stuck in one place or in one situation. If I need to be able to respond to the business needs and demands that are uh, put on me and how do I do that? So, I think the internet changed everything. It just took us a, a little while in the collection world to get there. Yeah, and I suppose in the collections world, I'm talking specifically around North America there, some of the conversations I have are very sort of telephony-based, still quite telephony-based. How do you think, is that moving? And for me, it feels like there's a real sort of clear benefit around using much more sort of digital kind of two-way inter interaction. What's stopping the industry adopting it more? Is it is it fear or just inertia? or what? And what can we do to change that? It feels like there's an opportunity there to really respond to customer needs, if nothing else. That's a really interesting question because that touches on the way where things are going forward these days, right? Mm. There's definitely different markets are behaving differently. I mean, you use the word AI in the US. There's definitely some regulations happening around AI and the way you handle mm -hmm. call. Uh, if some, if you call somebody, can an AI start the conversations, do collections on your behalf? That's a question. Uh, I think there's a lot of question marks around that. Uh, in Canada, the same thing. In the UK, it seems there's a lot of, sounds like there's a lot of compliance and a lot of regulations are these, but it'll, it's a lot more open mm. uh, from the point of view of, yeah, l let the system do the work for me. Mm. You know, let me let me automate. Let me send a text text message, and the person back there can validate it, and we get their approval uh, online, and they can uh, solve that problem. Because remember, uh, when you are collecting, there's consequence if you don't. If that 
the person client does not pay. It goes to credit bureaus. It goes to legal. It's not just a simple call. And 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 as I mentioned before, it's a professional call these days. There's no more people calling you and and, and screaming at you. That that is sort of way gone. And the people who still do it are basically are at the end of the tail of that market. It's a very professional. It's a very organized and systematic way. But there is a piece of, like you said, absolutely. I mean, today there is a requirement in, in all markets for consumer level that you have to send a letter in the mail. Mm. That's just a re- regulation requirement and compliance requirement. And there's a still strong resistance from the, the bodies that do these regulations to move away from that. Mm. But there's some point that's going to go away, right? I think so. You see it in terms of, we always had the thing around notifications on like your WhatsApp notifications or your SMS notifications. Would they be read by someone who was on the desk next to you and all those kind of things? And that's certainly here, it felt like that kind of fallen away to a certain extent and just what was something much more sensible. And it seems like that's much more accepted. And yet yet you still hear stories around, or you've got to have people on the phone. You've got to talk to people. If they're not available then they're not actually going to answer the phone, are they? Or if they're not available, and then you call back, and then it's out of hours, and that's where digital kind of comes in into play, it feels. Absolutely. And, and, and there's and there has to be some regulations around that. But if I'm a person at, at home, and uh, I need to check on a, a letter or notification I received, and uh, I do it after work, for example, and I'm, mm. and I call somebody, and uh, after hours... What do I have? Do I wait the next day somebody calls me back? Then I call them back and we'll send you a letter. And that's there's a high level of inefficiency and more importantly, like a high level of anxiety in, in, in people yeah. saying, I need that credit in bureau report fixed because it wasn't my issue. It was from my supplier mm. that, that sent me this stuff wasn't good. Would AI solve that? I think yes, absolutely mm. to a limit. And we have to be extremely forward looking and 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 adopt. Uh, AI early on, same as the way we adopted the internet. Yeah. And how do you think that's going to roll out from, particularly from a collections point of view? You talked about AI a couple of times there, and it's, it feels like there's been a furore around it the last sort of six months. And it was certainly last year, it was all that we talked about. And I feel that there's a little bit of like fear of missing out that's going on, which is I've got to have something that's AI. And we're asking the question, well, what actually is AI, right? Because if you look through it so through certain lenses, like automation, RPA, even things like some of the machine learning, you can say we've already had AI. We've had it for some of this stuff has been invented mathematically in the 70s. Whereas, yes. but like, we're only talking about it now. What do you think? What do you, where do you think the opportunities are? And what, what's your kind of view on it? I think it, so. We started a, using AI almost eight, 10 years ago. Hmm. We were a bit too early. <laughs> We had to explain what AI is, and, and people told us, oh, I already have that. And, and we, we had to explain what the difference between when you, you go on the phone, for example, and say, hey, mm. I'll make a payment, and that's a menu, versus mm. really having a chat with mm. a, 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 a system that you might say different wording for the same thing. I think the opportunities there are, are galore. And, and what we're focusing on today is for efficiencies and improvements in the way we do stuff. There's, like you said, it seems like the, the, the collection piece is somebody picking up the phone and calling somebody, right? And it's just a list. They keep going through it one, two, three, whatever times they have, right? But I think there's a better way than that. What if you focus on the right accounts to call at the right time? Mm. Right? What if you are you're able to adjust the timing when calling people and and, 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 and the method of well, not calling even actually communicating with them. Uh, mm-hmm. Not all of us are, are open for a, a phone call for these things and, and, and what they've noticed in the industry in the last, but let me say 10 years, we've been doing it longer. This text messaging is, is text, a, a big response, immediacy mm-hmm. of, 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 of a response. So AI has a big component to pay just, not only in one aspect, people look at it only from one angle, but you should really look at the opportunity from different angles. And the way we're looking at it today is that which uh, clients do you call? When do you mm-hmm. call them? And if you call them multiple times, what's your uh, uh, recourse from that point on? Mm-hmm. Do you just give, you have a list and you keep just calling it manually? Mm-hmm. Exactly what you said. 
How efficient is that? If you get to have AI to help you in that, and you look at trends and behaviors for similar accounts, then you can say we have better chance first in, in reaching the, the right people at the right time and getting results from them. Yeah. So from a use case point of view, you talked about a couple of things there, one of which is better segmentation, as an example, or the actually the ability to be able to respond. And then we've got stuff where you actually almost got respond by text and it's a respond by email. Maybe you got respond by voice as well. It started and come in respond by video. I don't think it's too far away or automated <laughs> video is not too far away as well. Um, which which use cases do you think we'll start to we'll start to see coming through first? Is it the segmentation pieces first and then text sort of customization? It's Definitely interest in two areas. That segmentation piece is big because you still have a lot of people making calls. You still have uh, uh, money out there in the market that you're not able to get back. So you need something, somebody to go after that. Definitely that's a very high on the list of everyone. Mm. And I think that's something that people have not been able to, to answer. Right? Mm. They look at scoring, they look at your uh, credit bureau score there too, or different models in that. Uh, really, this is, uh, if you think about it, if you keep doing what you, whatever you're doing, so you have to do different. So the segmentation piece, the scoring, the allocation, the timing, right? You know, if, you make, if you're calling somebody every day at nine o'clock and you're not getting an answer back, mm. shouldn't somebody tell you like, Hello, you've been trying this for a year. Mm. Have you tried different times? I'm not going to say it. Afternoon, 10 o'clock, mm. 8, yeah. whatever it is, whatever. Yeah. That's one. The other piece in, that everybody's interested in cutting costs, and, and people you think a lot of the calls they do, at least good 20% of them is just sort of response to somebody calling you back or just starting mm. conversation. 80% after that is really somebody as a human in the background taking care of the business after that. But that 20% is really high. If imagine if you have a company, let's say, have 100 or 10 collectors even. So 20% of their time is useless. Calling and nobody's answering or calling mm -hmm. that person's not there or answering a few questions there. Just, did you receive our letter? Did you see if our email? Okay, thank you very much. I'll talk to you next week. 20%. Mm -hmm. That's so. Imagine they're going that to the bottom line. So that these two areas seem to be of high interest in the industry today. And, and I was just reading a piece there around um, behavioral science. If you're looking around, how can we get hold of people and call in at the right time and those kind of things? But there's also an objective around what does the customer want from that conversation as well? And if you think about apps, and I so TikTok is one of the ones that you seem to get addicted by, or I seem to get addicted by anyway, and the afternoon <laughs> goes, but it's, they become so engaging and they're almost like the masters at engagement. How much do you think we can use those sort of like behavioral kind of tricks as much as anything to try and get people to engage and particularly if around support mechanisms in terms of getting people to pay off accounts? Do you think there is that, that how much of an opportunity do you think that is in the different markets? Definitely from a point of view of being able to go where or get results from what existing channels are there. There's a big opportunity there, right? We are always very careful about privacy and, and compliance and, and making sure that we are more ethical in, in, in the way we do this because this can go south very quickly. But definitely, if, if you look at it and if you do it properly, we should be using all kinds of channels to reach people, including social networks. Mm. It's a tricky piece. You mentioned TikTok and others, Facebook, LinkedIn, and all, Instagram, all the others. There is really a, a need in the market today when I'm talking to somebody, I need to have that contact, right? Mm. And there's better results if you are able to understand the situation from the other side because somebody doesn't pay not because they really are being trying to just not pay for their stuff. It's just a you know, life mm. situation. Bad habits, and unfortunately, today you can spend a lot without you thinking about it, right? So, a lot of awareness can, can help that, and, and maybe these new technologies from behavior point of view. What about 
the financial situation, particularly in, in Canada and certainly in, in, the, in the US as well, how's that sort of playing out over the last sort of six months? Over here, we've had a lot of discussion around cost of living, as an example. Food prices have gone up. Energy prices have gone up. We're, we're seeing that sort of like changes coming through. And that's had an impact in terms of consumers' ability to be able to have disposable income, as an example. What are you seeing with that sort of like locally in, in Canada? Is that also an increasing issue? And what do you think the impact's going to be over the near term in terms of arrears level? and then volumes into agencies and those kind of things. Uh, absolutely. There's uh, definitely the, that high cost of living is impacting mm. uh, everybody in the world, Canada, US, and UK. Definitely in Canada, we've seen that sort of numbers go up high very quickly. Cost of living mm. is extremely sort of, you know, people stretch to, to mm. make ends meet from starting from their mortgages and rents all the way to putting food on the table. And as... The market finds its way around that. Unfortunately, people start to, they need to stop old habits. They have to mm. stop buying the way they, they were spending in the COVID days. Mm. And, and, and they need to change habits because, as you see, they're accumulating debts mm. as you go along. And at some point or another, somebody's going to say, where's my money? Yeah. And do you think we're getting to the point where there's basically going to be a new reality? Because over here, we'll talk about inflations coming down. But as long as inflation is positive, prices are still going up. So we're never going to go back down to the way things were before. Take, just take uh, the average food shop as an example for, the, for, for an average consumer. It's, it's never going to go down to... Let's say it, it used. Let's say it used to be a hundred dollars. Now it's one hundred and sixty dollars on average on a week. It's never going to go back down to that hundred dollars. What it won't do is it just won't go to one hundred and seventy dollars quite as quickly. So, is this a new reality? Do you think that we're going to have to deal with, and then the businesses are going to have to deal with as well in terms of the amount they've lent out and those kind of things? Because those kind of changes make can be quite difficult for businesses in terms of their collections process as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think the first thing we have to think about how how does inflation get calculated? Are we comparing it to the year 2000 mm. is that two three percent is relative to, to the year 2000 so what mm. i paid uh, pounds for a uh, year 2000 today it's only two percent above that or is mm. it that last year's and last month 2000 mm. my ten dollars is already 20 dollars mm. pounds and dollars and, and it's, it's percentage on that so what mm. do we include in, cal in calculating inflation right so what are the items that impact that number up and down the bottom line, people are having a hard time to uh, save and keep money in their pockets, right? And and that is really the, 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 the crutches of things. So it's always a pressure for the numbers to go up. And a lot of businesses try hard not to push the number up because they can lose business, right? So depending on, on, on the market you're in. If it's food, you have to buy it. There's no choice, right? Mm. But there are things that you say, I can go without a, a new car for the next few years. I can go without a, a new shirt or maybe I'll make use of my uh, running shoes for a little bit longer. <laughs> mm. Eventually, you have to pay the new price. But it's quite interesting. So some things are very quick in terms of reacting to inflation. So things like food is quite quick, as you say. Other things take a little bit of time to basically flow through, particularly if you've got stock or inventory or those kind of things. So those are a little bit more lagged. And then what's probably the most lagged is probably uh, salaries, uh, salaries going up, which is to pay for everything. So you get these sort of like timing issues that, that cause quite a lot of challenges for people in terms of affordability because prices of food, you have to buy it. Healthcare, you have to buy it. You've got no, you've got no option. Whereas in Inflation in terms of wage inflation, people are trying to keep pressures on that, but you actually need that to be able to afford the extra prices. Right? Absolutely. But you have to give uh, the human race some credit. They change habits and they change things. Yes, it's not as fast, but look, there's a, a adoption of electrical car. And, and um, we shall not go into debate how good or bad that is. That's definitely a, a different conversation from talking about how much oil do we pump out of the uh, yeah. from uh, the earth, right? Uh, change of habits. People are making do with a lot of stuff, and because mm -hmm. there's that ability to of information and and availability of information, the intelligence of human beings is still helping them to make you know, some 
better decision, decisions than others. I think also constraints. If you've got a constrained system, that, that allows you to be more inventive. So if you said you've got, if I said, like, Sam, you've got all the money in the world, you can t- create whatever system you possibly want for whatever market you possibly want, you'd be like, you'd probably say, number one, say, Chris, thanks very much. I, I appreciate having all the money in the world. But then you'd be kind of like, well, then when am I going to spend it? It's almost like it's so wide. But if we say, look, you've got to, you've got to solve this particular problem for this particular customer, then it targets the team, I would think. So I think maybe constraints help us maybe come up with solutions. Absolutely. Look at the way we work today. We, unless you have to be where you are face-to-face with another person, we want that flexibility. It's not that say, I want to work from home, I don't want to go to the office. We want that flexibility. We want that ability for us to be more efficient and do things more efficiently. And efficiency is an issue in Canada, by the way. So that's something that we are struggling with at the moment. And I think we will find solution to that very quickly. Mm. But efficiency, ability to be able to take control of the way you do things. So that, like I said, we have to give a little bit of credit to the human race mm. and, 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 and not all the time, I know, but at least definitely the younger generation, look at the generation, the millennials, the Zs and the Ys, and they, they are looking at ways to, to, to do things. They're on the phone all the time. That's why I think that the digital strategy particularly is important because they're on the phone all the time. And like, how do we how do we react to that and get hold of those folks, right, as well? Because they're the, as always, in all generations, they're the consumers of the future, aren't they? If you were to, if you were to pick five things that you think are, are going to be themes that we've got to watch out for, what do you think, what would you think would be the, the five or so themes you think, but well, these we've got to watch because these could actually come through and be the new developments in the future. What's Where, where are the areas which you're going to think are going to be important? Oh, God. <laughs> I think definitely adoption of uh, digitaliz- digitalization is, is the big one. AI is a buzzword today, but I think it becomes reality probably the next decade or so. Mm. It's, it's, and there's a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, a lot of expectations of what it can and cannot do. But definitely us be more available, like mobility, like phones. So mm. I think these Three technologies together, they go very fast together. Uh, at the same time, I think we we would look at different uh, behavioral uh, trends in, in the industries and the and cost uh, and efficiency, cost cutting, and mm. organizations looking to make better margins. How do they do that? How and we focus actually that's our number five on solving the problems mm. that we. Our systems give our clients. Mm. Um, we don't focus on mainly, oh, I'm going to give you the, the greatest thing ever like today. Because that may, maybe it's nice. It's You have a, a new toy, but is it making you more efficient? Is it making mm. you able to do, in, in our case, collections? So I would say high on the list is uh, mobility, AI, digitization, uh, and all related efficiencies. Yeah, it does feel... To me, as if we're in a bit of an inflection point, a bit like when computers first came in, which is like all of a sudden everything seems to kind of change. And it feels like maybe it's not quite the same as something brand new, but it's it feels like we're going through quite a lot of change and things could be quite a lot different afterwards. Even from an employment point of view, it's like it feels like we're going through another wave, almost like of the decade of the of the, next, of the 20 years or so. We'll see a time will tell. And sometimes these things take a little longer than you than you, maybe you have in your mind than that actually flow through. Yeah, and, and uh, I would say, Chris, one thing that's sort of always in the back of my mind, shouldn't there be a coordinated effort in, in, in fighting fraud and uh, in fighting any, and not only because these things you cannot control based mm. on one, one country at a time or even mm. one, one content. It has to be, I would say, global effort mm. for whatever reason. We are not doing that. That's a piece. You look at the cryptocurrency. That was a really big buzzword. Are, are we going still there? Mm. It seems there is some hesitation around that, right? It feels to me like we talk about these things. They become a big buzzword. People usually put it as dot something on their internet address or in their company name. <laughs> yeah. And then it seems like it, well, it goes over that peak and then it goes quiet. And it goes quiet for a while. But then underneath, that's when things really start to be worked on. And then you start to see things almost like rising afterwards, which are actually the real use cases. So but yeah. there's value there. It just takes longer than we think. I, I, 
don't want to date myself, but I remember the days where I used to go to the library and look for books yeah. and ask the librarian, where, where can I find a book about this topic? Jeez, uh, I'm a computer whiz. I code yeah. using Google. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different world. That's the realities of things. But definitely the, the, the coordinated effort is not there. Uh, that sort of concerns me yeah. from that, that point of view. Um, uh, and, and, but at the same time, exactly, buzzwords. AI is not going, it's just same as computers. Mm. It's just going to take different shapes and, 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 and it's really a smarter computer, put it that way, if you mm. want to simplify it. One item I didn't mention is really quantum computing. That's coming on, on the horizon. That'll be my yeah, yeah, fifth yeah. item. Quantum yeah. computing is going to be a game changer. And, and, and I, I think they're telling us it's probably in the next five years you'll see that. For people who don't know what that is, it's just whatever you execute today will be in the millions times faster than what we do yeah. today. I do think if you look at quantum computing and having multiple states happening at the same time or collapsing at the same time, matching that with the way some of the the attention mechanisms and the, tra and the transformers kind of work with the AI stuff, if you think about those two in the same sentence with the GPT stuff and quantum computing, all of a sudden you're reaching like another level beyond what we can even do in terms of that, because it's almost like the technology is almost like seen made for each other to a certain extent. And you could say maybe that's a little bit scary from an AI point of view in terms of being able to calculate all of these interrelationships, but it is a very interesting. And you do wonder if there's a, there's a symbiosis there almost like waiting to happen. Absolutely. You know, I said, you know, we're, we're here where we are because of who we are. Yeah. And I think that we will do better as these things come to fruition. We, we start mm. utilizing whatever we've put together in, in efficiency. And definitely, mm. people can't see the world without the internet. People didn't, mm. can't, didn't see the world without telephones, mm. without electricity. Okay. Mm. So is the whole world going that way? Mm. I don't know. We'll get into a very philosophical debate around <laughs> AI at some point, but I suppose it does seem like there's opportunities in the short term around like the digital adoption, those kind of things. So, Absolutely. Sam, thanks very much for making the time today. I really appreciate it. Very interesting in terms of adoptions and particularly the nuances between the different markets. You're across three of them and it's interesting just to, to have a leg in each and really be able to understand it because you can obviously bring the best from each of those to all, each of the other markets, which I think is fascinating as well. So, Sam, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, for having me. I uh, hope that our, our listeners will find this interesting.